a bit about us as well. Part of Brian's mission um, is to build a better startup ecosystem by connecting, educating, and inspiring local entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, so as part of these digital fireside chats, um, this month, month we are very excited to host Scott Tong um, of Designer Found, who was previously the head of design at Pinterest. So very interesting um, topic, and I will pass it to Dan. Dan? Great, great. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Scott. One, your 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 CV is obviously quite incredible. I'm hoping you can kind of walk us through your your experience, and and also I want to touch upon, you know, what is design and and why is that such a such an important thing to have. Well, two very uh, t t important topics that I could probably talk hours about, but. Um, first off, I want to say thank you to you all for hosting me. You could have spent your time anywhere tonight at 7 p.m., um, but you chose to spend it with us. So we hope to make it worth your while. Um, so it sounds like there's two kind of main questions there, kind of what my journey was in a nutshell, then two, kind of what the importance of design is. Yes. Um, and I think um, they're, they're, they're interrelated because my career um, has twists and turns that have kind of shown me the different impact that design can have at different scales. So, you know, maybe I can use that framework of um, my journey from a student to a professional and how that definition has sort of changed over time. Um, is that a good, good yeah. place to start? Yeah, it's however you want to take us on this journey, man. Right on. So um, I uh, grew up in Seattle, Washington, uh, kind of the West Coast of the United States. And um, my father was an engineer. My brother was um, a business major. He ended up working. They, my mother was accounts payable, and they all ended up working at the same place for the city of Seattle. And uh, as a young student, I was like, I just don't want to do what they're doing. And so uh, my choice was to uh, go to the university, and it was like the only place I could afford to go. But it ended up being a really great place to go because they had a great design program. I had no idea when I joined. Um, and I learned kind of the nuts and bolts of graphic design, what I studied. And very fortunately, during my time there, uh, there was a visiting professor who ended up, uh, who had a studio in Seattle, a small studio, about seven people, and hired me on as an intern kind of uh, before I graduated. And so I was very lucky to kind of get mentorship as a professional very early on in my kind of um, uh, foray into design, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a small studio working on brand, uh, mostly brand work. And, you know, Microsoft was one of the kind of notable clients. We did packaging for breweries, et cetera. So as a young designer, it was just really fun to um, see a, a range of projects. And um, it, it was very traditional in the sense that graphic design was being applied to mediums that people kind of knew what graphic design was for at that time. This is kind of early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but one thing I remember from design school was watching this video um, on a U.S. news program called Nightline where uh, a design firm called Idea was featured and they redesigned the shopping cart experience. Um, they kind of went into a Whole Foods, um, walked this news program through the process of what it would be like to redesign a shopping cart. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they they went through the research process. They um, looked at kind of some of the the safety issues of existing um, shopping carts, um, some of the security issues, you know, sometimes shopping carts get stolen, um, you know, wh what's the functionality, what are the behaviors of professional shoppers and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I was very intrigued by this this firm, but I had no idea what a graphic designer would ever do at a place like this. Yeah, that, um, that seems like a, a large kind of gap between doing graphic design and, and talking about really how these operations kind of fit together. Right. Right. So I, you know, I, I had, you know, I think um, at this point, IDO, the firm that I'm talking about was became really well known uh, in part because of this video that came out. But uh, I had an opportunity to apply for a job there as a graphic designer, um, kind of shot my resume out there in the dark and, you know, 
um, had no idea I would actually hear back. But the next day I got a call and, you know, a couple of days later I was flying down to have an interview and, and share my portfolio, which is amazing. Um, but still, I didn't really know what would a graphic designer do at a, at a place like this. And um, very fortunately, there were they were starting to build up graphic design as a capability within this kind of more product centric world that idea was a part of. And um, over six years there, I worked for, you know, I consulted on hundreds of projects across dozens of industries, um, was able to travel the world and see kind of how design as a process can get applied to lots of different kinds of problems and can get expressed as a solution not just through graphic design, but also through um, industrial design or service design or environmental design. And so design, the definition of design vastly expanded over the course of my time there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was able to contribute in a kind of graphic and communication way, but I was also able to be collaborating with and inspired by folks that had other skill sets as it related to design including things like business design. Mm -hmm. Um, So that definition was mind blowing, right? I I had no idea, you know, while I was studying in school, you know, typography and layout publications and packaging, these kinds of things that some of that thinking that you're using to arrange things in a layout, um, you know, you're thinking about um, primary a secondary and and tertiary reads of information you're thinking about how somebody is going to experience a publication from page turn to page turn some of that same thinking is applied to other kinds of problems like service design mm-hmm. um a project that that idea worked on that quite famously was kind of like the amtrak train riding experience and it's not just about what it's like to sit in the train it's about uh the decision to go on a trip in the first place um, figuring out what your route is going to be. How are you doing that? You know, are you doing that on a map? Are you doing that on an online service? Um, what about the ticket purchase experience? What about when you get to the kiosk? What about when you check in? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what about when you find your seat? Following that user through the journey, um, you know, is something that uh, I think is inherent in in most design practices, but was really um, focused in on honed in on at IDEO and very famously they're known for their kind of human centered design process and design thinking is a, is a term that was uh, either coined or popularized by IDEO, depending on who you ask. And I was, um, I was fortunate to kind of be in, in the, in that place at that time to experience what the impact of that could be, mm-hmm. not just at an academic level, but at a practical level. So it, it sounds like, I mean, cause I think that in general, design is kind of like this very nebulous term, but what you're saying is it, it's so much more than just kind of moving pixels around or or visual layouts, but it's kind of this all-encompassing methodology to to solve these problems. That's right. And I think that's actually a big problem with the industry of design and the, is that the definition of design is so nebulous. Um, you know, I think if you look up the definition of design in the dictionary, there's something like 14 different definitions and they're all correct. Um, you know, it's a noun, it's a verb, it can be an adjective. Um, it, it, it means so many things, but it also, because it means so many things, it can oftentimes mean nothing mm-hmm. or everything at the same time. So I think there's a responsibility for folks who have made it, you know, made um, some impact in an industry through design to help articulate kind of the space of design Mm -hmm. so that those that are kind of, you know, following in those footsteps can be more articulate about what they mean when they're talking about specific aspects of design. So, you know, of those 14 different definitions, it can mean anything from pixels that are going to ship for our digital product to way far upstream um, deciding on the strategic direction of a company Mm -hmm. and everything in between. So when say a junior designer is talking about their designs and a, you know, senior executive is talking about designing the next quarter or the next half year um, plan roadmap, Mm -hmm. 
you're using the same word to describe two very different activities. So I think it behooves us as, as folks that either work in design or work with design as cross-functional partners to articulate what do we mean when we're talking about design. Um, and design encompasses all of those things. So it's really important to say, okay, I'm, I'm trying to be more articulate and, ex and expressive to the folks that maybe don't have a sophisticated understanding of design, what I'm talking about and what mm -hmm. activities I'm going to engage in. So for, for those of us who are not um, particularly well-schooled in design, can you, can you kind of walk through the basics of, of things that we should be paying attention to that we're not or, or maybe why this should be like our first move as opposed to an afterthought? Sure. Yes, I think um, there's a there's a couple point places to start. One would be that like art and design get conflated a lot. Um, a lot of folks think that like design is this because there are certain tools that get used in commonality between artists and designers. For example, um, you know, visual, right? Visual design. There are visual artists, um, but the purpose is different. Artists oftentimes are looking to express their own point of view and they're leaving that expression up to interpretation. Designers oftentimes are using the same tool set, some visuals, um, to solve a problem for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so that I think there's a, there's a distinct difference between problem solving and expression. And there are, there's certainly some overlap, not only in tools, but you know, a designer may express a solution in a particular style because maybe it, it um, kind of connotes some sort of emotion that hopefully reaches the end user in some, in some way. Um, but I think design typically has a, a user in mind mm -hmm. and oftentimes that user is not the designer themselves. You know, I'd say 99% of the time, it's not the designer themselves that they're designing for, it's somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it requires that designer to think, um, to be empathic, who, who is this person? Who are these people that I'm designing for? And how do I understand them? How do I truly understand not just what they are saying and doing, but also how they are thinking and feeling? Mm -hmm. And that requires research, that requires empathy. And so those are some basic kind of skills of designers that are necessary. That also sounds like it also, it, it kind of requires a bit of a leap of faith, right? Like you have to kind of make guesses at people are thinking or feeling or wanting. Yes. Um, what happens when that goes wrong? Well, I think there's um, uh, something else about design is that it is iterative, especially in, in digital products, but I think even in physical products, right? Like the there's how many versions of the iPhone are there or the Google Pixel or any piece of hardware that you use? Um, you know, how many versions of a chair are there? Mm -hmm. that, that is industrial design. And so um, I wouldn't say that the, I think what you to pay attention to is design is also a process of learning. Um, the, the question is like, on what cycle are you learning? Are you learning on a rapid iteration cycle of shipping a digital product week over week? Or are you, you know, shaping the shape of a chair for, you know, Milan furniture um, exhibition once every two years, mm -hmm. right? You're going to try to update the things that do uh, that don't work, and then kind of double down on the things that do work. And I think that's a that's a more seasoned um, experience with design. You know, of course, we would love to on the first shot, um, you know, design the perfect thing and never have to touch it again. But how many things outside of nature does that actually happen? Right? Even books are updated with new editions of content. Mm -hmm. The content it has, you know, has been outdated, and therefore must be updated to, um, you know, stay relevant, stay current with the times. And of course, there are certain principles that um, maybe are more durable than others, and those those principles can last a really long time. But even those, uh, you know, change on a long cycle as well. Okay. Well, um, just to kind of transition slightly back, because I, I realize I kind of jumped in on your your experience. That's all right. Um, after IDEO, you were at IFT. Oh, uh, yeah, IFT yes. And that. That's right. Um, which for a little while was like the hot new startup. What what happened there? Yeah. So, you know, po kind of during my time at IDEO, six years of consulting, um, you know, we were, we were recommending to clients, here's some things that you might do, and we hope that you should do them. And 
if it goes really well, you know, maybe you get credit as a consultant. Um, maybe you don't. Maybe it's it's completely, you know, um, confidential, and it, the client wants to make it look like they came up with everything. And when it goes wrong, you know, you might take all the blame because it's the consultant's fault. Um, so what I kind of was uh, craving post IDEO was more skin in the game. How do you apply some of these theories that you're suggesting to clients to something that you are building yourself mm -hmm. where you can make more of the decisions, but you also own more of the accountability as well. So myself and two other coworkers who worked in different kind of branches of IDEO, um, you know, we would ride on our commute back between San Francisco and Palo Alto and just talk about ideas. And uh, Lyndon Tibbetts, who is the founder of, of, of If This Then That, he kind of came up with this idea and it was just a napkin sketch at the time. You know, what if, you know, APIs, this is kind of like early 2010-ish, 2009, um, APIs were starting to become more and more popular in kind of the developer community. Um, and services were able to be connected together through these open APIs. Um, so there was his this kind of brilliant idea was like, what if you could just connect services together and allow people to do that instead of um, waiting for developers to kind of figure out the integrations for the people that you know might use them eventually. And so kind of uh, if this and that, or if as we called it, was born kind of out of these car rides back and forth. And uh, Lyndon kind of you know left IDEO and decided to do this thing on his own. Uh, very shortly after, Jesse Tain, co-founder, um, joined him. And then shortly after that, I joined as well. And um, yeah, it was the... I think it was a really exciting time because it was the sort of wild west of APIs. And um, I, the thesis, which I still believe in, is that, you know, there are, humans have this experience with physical products that goes back millennia, right? If it's windy and, um, you know, you have a stack of papers and you have a can of soda, you know that if you put that can of soda on that stack of papers, the, the papers aren't going to fly away. Mm -hmm. Right. There's these interactions between physical products, these properties of physical products. And they are second nature to us because we've interacted with them for so long, right? Since birth, but also, you know, through generations. Now, digital products are starting to emerge at this time and they have properties as well. So we're just coming to understand what those properties are in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and how they interact is starting to become more and more popular, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. So, you know, a tweet has specific properties. Mm -hmm. You can favorite it, you can retweet it, you can quote it. Um, an Instagram post has specific qualities. A Dropbox file has specific qualities. Mm -hmm. Just like physical objects have properties. So, you know, should they and can they interact? And if so, can we empower people to um, create that interaction themselves rather than waiting for somebody to make the rules up for them. For them. So that was kind of the underlying thesis. Um, and so, you know, we were probably the talk of the town in 2011, 2012, because it was such a ch an interesting problem. And I think we were kind of defining the space at the time. Okay. And um, obviously you're not still at IFT. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, this is something that happens in, in, in startups is that, um, you know, founders oftentimes will have differences of opinions about what direction to take certain aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. It might be the business itself. It might be the culture of the team. It might be leadership style, et cetera. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for my time at IFT and it was uh, a place that I validated a lot of my product thinking skills and was responsible for things like the brand and things like the first version of the mobile app, things like communicating this very abstract concept of um, APIs and coding on the internet mm -hmm. to people who don't know what APIs are and probably don't code. And that is kind of the, some of the most important takeaways for me as a, as a professional and as a designer from that time at IFT. But ultimately, there, you know, there are many reasons why I ended up leaving, but one of them was that we ended up disagreeing on how to monetize that business. So, um, you know, as somebody who worked there, loved the product, um, 
it was really challenging for me to to imagine that I, as a consumer of that product, would also be willing to pay for those specific integrations mm -hmm. as a as a end user. You know, I just want the value. If I, you know, if I have an Instagram photo that's tagged, save it to my Dropbox folder. That's great. Am I going to pay a nominal fee for that to happen time and time again? Um, maybe not at that time. Maybe I think consumers were not ready. However, if I was, say, Twitter or Instagram or um, you know, uh, Belkin, which is kind of a, a hardware manufacturer, is a hard, hardware manufacturer. They would be curious, I think, as um, as providers of services on the platform to understand how are consumers use it, connecting our products to other products as a canary in the mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so my my thought was that you know maybe our customers and our users are two different parties, and um, that was ultimately one of the reasons why you know we parted ways was because we we disagreed on where our, where the the business was going to be monetized and ultimately you know um, there are other businesses that have popped up since then Zapier being probably the most notable and they I think they got it right they when, when they launched out of YC they were a competing product and they called themselves Ift for Business mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I think Ift could have had an opportunity to also be if for business, right, right, um, and I think I read recently that um, that Zapier raised about a million in funding over their entire existence, and recently has rumored to have sold shares to Sequoia at a four billion dollar valuation. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a few billion. It's it's pretty impressive. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. so I think it's it's like it's a great example of like really understanding, um, you know, de ex de designing an experience is super important. Of course, mm -hmm. I think that's that is table stakes. But as you think about designing a business, as you think about designing um, an ecosystem, a marketplace, understanding the difference between your customer and your user, I think, is a mistake that can can be overlooked. Um, that that I think can be learned from as well. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes it's important to follow the money because businesses are entities that need to fund, self-sustain their own existence. Right over time, mm -hmm. even though you hear about these like wild valuations in, in startup news all the time, when they the the goal for most of these companies is to make it to a place where they are sustainable, self sustaining, their own existence, and so kind of keeping an eye on that. It doesn't always have to happen kind of at the earliest stages, and it's arguable, you know, if the right decision was made at the right time or not. But I think you know to take the lesson is to step back from just that one. Um, situation and then see does that how does that maybe apply to others mm -hmm. um, can I look at another business with that same wisdom now and make a better judgment call the next time that opportunity comes around so speaking of another business and obviously another opportunity after after if this then that you went to Pinterest correct that's right that's right and that's obviously a very well-known name can you tell us a little bit about your experience there sure so um, kind of post uh, IFT, uh, one thing I was missing was kind of working with a team of designers. So at IFT, I was the only designer in a team full of technical folks. And I love all my technical folks, don't get me wrong. Um, but I was craving and missing kind of some of the time I had at IDEA where I was able to collaborate and be inspired by lots of other designers. Mm -hmm. And so kind of my measuring stick for what I was going to do next was, you know, can I... Um, can I collaborate with really talented folks that have more of a design background, of course, still be connected to the technology space? Um, and thankfully, I was connected through some uh, previous IDEO alumni to uh, the team at Pinterest. And at the time, it was about 200 people. There was a brand team um, of four people, including myself, and a product design team of about nine people, I think, mm -hmm. at the time. So, that, and this, you know, so that's nine or 10 folks out of 200, you can kind of imagine that the majority of the folks there were either engineering or operational. Um, so I started on the brand team. I spent about a year there, really just kind of immersing myself in some of the things that I was comfortable with as a designer um, from my previous life. Um, but then, you know, I, I certainly had an itch to continue to develop my product skills. Um, and I felt like I had a pretty good sense of those from my time at IFT as well. Um, so I asked the, you know, at the then head of design, Hey, you know, I have, I just want to be impactful, you know, and 
um, while I do feel like I've made an impact on the brand side, I think there's work to be done on the product side. And I think I have some, something to offer. And so, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was on the product design team and I was working on new user onboarding, which, you know, I'm, I'm super passionate about just in general for any product. Like it's such a critical touch point for people to get onboarded. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to this day, explaining Pinterest is not the easiest thing to people. Um, what is it? You know? um, and so I spent a significant portion of my time trying to kind of really hone in on that story. And, if, and still, you know, as you mentioned, what happens when you're wrong? Sometimes mm -hmm. you can make the wrong choices, but the, the point is to continue to learn. And the onboarding kind of experience was critical, a critical juncture for the growth team. And so my influence on the, the, the product grew from just onboarding to kind of growth overall. Over a couple of years there, I ended up leading, you know, a portion of the growth function for several years. And then um, kind of steadily started to grow my influence outside of just growth to the core product. And then eventually, by the time I left, I was the head of product design. And what would you say kind of your your takeaways were from your your time at Pinterest, right? Because it's obviously still it's still around. It it certainly has gotten through its ups and downs. Um, like as, as for the aspiring designers out there or or the people who are just starting to kind of sink their teeth into these concepts, um, you know, what should they be looking out for? What should they kind of chase after the best practices, what have you? There's a lot, a lot loaded in there, a lot packed in there. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I, no, that's a, that's a, I think it's a, it's a valid question. I think um, to unpack it a little bit, I think there are things to think about from a career navigation standpoint. And I think there are things to think about from a kind of industry you know, market standpoint as well, and probably other dimensions that I haven't, you know, really thought of as well quite yet. But I'll start with kind of career navigation. Um, you know, I think it, a good rule, rule of thumb is to surround yourself with people that you admire and respect. Um, it sounds really simple, but, um, you know, you have to be learning and hopefully those people are learning from you or um, at least getting energy from you. I think the energy is really important. Uh, it's this uh, intangible that uh, really makes a huge difference in your day. I mean, how many of you have been in a meeting with your manager and you feel drained? It makes you not motivated to come back the next day and give it your best effort. But if on average your, your energy level is um, increased, with the people around you, it makes you motivated to want to uh, kind of succeed mm -hmm. even more to, uh, you know, to not let your folks down. Um, and to also be self aware of, are you draining people's energy? Or are you empowering them with energy? And I think that as a kind of like emotional barometer of, uh, are you in the right environment is maybe one thing to think about. Um, of course, there's like skill sets as well. Um, you know, as a as a manager, as a director, and as a head of product design, uh, a framework that I'm keen on and helping managers and directors and, and folks that manage people to understand is that there are really kind of three dimensions that I think about a lot in structuring a, a successful organization. That is, uh, especially a skills based kind of de um, a skills a skills-based um, discipline like design mm -hmm. is that there's something that you're good at, hopefully, something that you care about, and then something that the business needs. And those three dimensions are dynamic, all of them, right? Mm -hmm. the, th the skills that you are good at right now, may, you might continue to want to get better at those things. Um, and hopefully that whatever you're good at is something that's valuable to the business, otherwise they wouldn't have hired you. Um, but then also something that you care about, right? You might be really good at this menial task, but you don't care about it. So you're probably not going to stay there very long because you're thinking about, well, where can I apply the thing, my skills in areas that I do care, right? right. The, and then that third dimension is, well, what does the business need? And this is a two-way street. As an individual that is trying to kind of make advancements in, in your skill set and in your career, it is on you to figure out what you're good at, to develop those skills, to articulate what you care about, mm 
Mm -hmm. and then to try to find the opportunities within the business where those skills are best leveraged, right? But also as a good manager, it is important that you speak to your people and understand, well, how do I understand what people are good at? How do I understand what they care about? How do I stand, understand what the business needs? And how do I triangulate that on a recurring basis so that I'm putting people in the best position possible, not only for them as individuals to be successful, mm -hmm. but also for the business to get the most value out of each employee. So that's, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm sort of a systems thinker and I try to see things not just from one perspective, but from multiple perspectives. And I think that's a skill set that designers um, oftentimes inherently have, um, but take time to really hone in and be able to articulate. Mm -hmm. I think everybody can have those skills. Sure. It's so, I mean, my experience with designers is a lot of times I think they, the business didn't always value them the way they should have been valued. Is, is that a failing of the business or the designer or a combination thereof? Or I think it goes back to this definition, this, this poor definition of what design is and what the impact of design can be. Mm -hmm. So if an organ is, I, I think the, the short answer is it's a two way street and there is a responsibility of education from those that have made an impact, as I mentioned, but it's also um, a responsibility of the individual to articulate like, here's what I mean, you know, like say it a thousand different ways, but like get to an understanding. And that's the important thing from the, from the bottom up. From the top down, it requires empathy. If you don't care what your designer has to say, then of course it's gonna be a terrible environment for a designer to work in long-term because you're discounting the value that design could possibly bring, just like you would discount the the value that any other discipline could bring if you don't respect what their point of view is or you're, you don't have empathy for what their point of view is. Of course, you can't be spending all of your cycles listening, listening, and listening and not doing. And so it is also the responsibility of um, leaders to understand when it when the time is to have an open conversation and then when the time is to make some decisions and move. And everybody, you know, regardless of your level, should understand that these are these things go through cycles. As you mentioned, you know, you don't know you're wrong until you try something. Mm -hmm. So, um, hey, we tried it your way, and things didn't work out. So, why is that? Would we try it again? Would we do the same things again? Or what things would we augment? Those are questions that everybody can ask, regardless of, you know, where they sit inside the level of an organization. Okay. And then um, just kind of my, my last question, because you've now moved on to the designer fund. Um, when you are kind of evaluating different entrepreneurs, teams, even even startups, you know, what is the what are the key elements that you're that you're looking for that um, I guess in general? And then what are the ones that startups are generally missing? Interesting. Yeah, I think uh, well, caveat everything was saying that, like, I am a uh... Uh, I'm still calibrating my own judgment in this industry. And, you know, one of the reasons I kind of um, kind of attach myself to designer fund is that I want to learn from folks that are doing this professionally. Um, it's easy to say, I, you know, I'm willing to give money to some company, some company will take it. Right. Mm -hmm. But am I dumb money or am I smart money? Um, and am I, do I have skin in the game or am I, am I, you know, investing other people's money? There's a big difference in those situations. So, I'll caveat everything by saying I don't I don't know what I'm doing, um, but I'm but I'm certainly exploring it with a kind of designer's mindset, which is to try to understand as much as I can mm -hmm. and kind of take in information and and of course try some things, fail, and then learn from those failures. Um, so your your question is what do I look for? And certainly a lot of those things come from my experiences. You know, can I understand what team dynamics, good team dynamics, look and feel like? Do I feel like the people that are trying to solve said problem are the right people to solve this problem? And what gives me that confidence? Is it their track record? Is it their chemistry? Is it the traction of their product? Um, there are lots of different ways to evaluate a company. Um, and I think, especially at the early stages, um, you know, there's some, some dimensions to look at. Team is certainly up there as one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. The idea is another, the product, if they have one, is another, and then the market is another. Um, 
some folks enter their evaluation through different lenses. Um, some might look at it from a market first perspective. If it's not a billion dollar market, I don't care, right? Um, or some might say that team is most important. And I probably, I tend to, I think, um, sort of gravitate towards that end because oftentimes ideas um, will change, will shift over time. I think pivot has become this term that is almost, you know, commonplace in, in the startup industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see that many companies have pivoted, um, and become massive successes because of those changes. And if you were just investing in the idea, you would have missed out because you thought the idea was dumb, but the team actually was what led to those changes in, in direction, right? Sure. Pinterest, Pinterest is one of them. I think Instagram is another story. Um, uh, so I think those examples exist all over the place and, um, but one thing that is consistent is like really strong team members um, are able to navigate the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so do you have confidence that those folks can navigate the uncertainty? One, that's a skill set. But also two, are even if they can navigate uncertainty, are they the right ones to solve a particular problem? Okay, great. Um, we're going to open it up for Q&A, but I'm going to go first. Sure. Um, so... My, my experience here in, in Europe and in Amsterdam is that we're probably five years behind what's happening in, in the Bay Area. Um, what advice would you give to yourself five years ago? I think, um, you know, I think now that I'm sort of in the investment ecosystem a little bit, I think um, context matters and I, I don't know if this is a lesson learned from five now looking back five years or something that I think is just another example of orders of magnitude or scales is I made this example earlier of um, layout of an, on a page, right? You're a graphic designer. You're, you're thinking about uh, what's the title, what's the body copy, where's the image go? How do they all relate to each other on the page? Um, there's some dynamics there, right? Mm -hmm. And, you might move things around until it feels right. Um, but there are certain elements. There's atomic units, and then there's kind of this macro unit, which is the page. And then even if you zoom out even further, there's the chapter, and then there's the um, overall structure of the narrative, and then there's the book. And then the book sits inside of a library, mm -hmm. right? And even the book sits inside of a section of the library. It's focused on a particular topic, and then it's in a library, and then it's in a building, right? So these orders of magnitude from typography all the way to a building. There's some sort of connection there, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think the same thing of organizations. Um, there are individuals and individual contributors. There are, there are cross-functional teams. There are pods that make up a specific business unit that then make up uh, a part of a larger kind of product that are part of a business, that are part of an industry. And I think zooming in and out of where you are, what you're working in, um, is a is a valuable skill to practice, to to think about. Like, why am I doing what I'm doing right now, and how does it relate to everything else that's going on? And I know as a young designer, that can be very that can be overwhelming to kind of think about. But that's why it requires practice. And the reason that I suggest people do that, zooming in and zooming out, is to understand like what impact I am having right now and what impact the larger, the bigger picture has um, overall over a longer period of time. Cause it's really easy. Everything looks big close up when you're focused on something. It's like, it's the most important thing in the world. But if you don't take a, a minute to stop and look around you, you might be working really hard on something that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And, from a career navigation standpoint, there's an analogy that I use, and maybe I shared it with you guys when we talked earlier, not on this call, but on a different call. Um, you have to have a compass and you have to have a steering wheel. Your compass tells you what direction you want to be heading, right? Mm -hmm. And it's important to have both because if you only have a compass, you might just go off in the direction that you want to be heading and you might go off a cliff, right? Like you're not thinking about what's, Kind of right in front of your feet mm -hmm. at the same time you have to have a steering wheel the steering wheel helps you navigate some of the obstacles that are in front of you kind of coming at you in real time but 
if you don't have a compass, you might be navigating in the short term, kind of jumping from place to place. And then five years down the line, you're like, I'm nowhere near where I wanted to be. I haven't even, right? Where you're still in a so parking kind of, lot. You're still in a parking lot. You've been driving in circles. So maybe it's not the best analogy, but I think the the reason I mentioned that is that it's a different order of magnitude to think about what's happening in the short term than it is to think about what's happening in the long term. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can start to make it a habit of aligning those two perspectives, hopefully as your career develops, you're more aligned with where you want it to be in the first place. And you're taking the time to reflect at each kind of milestone. Am I headed in the right direction? You know, or maybe this kind of, maybe though, even though I veered off path, it's actually pointing me in a new direction and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But to have that conversation with yourself to like, make sure that you have, you're staying in touch with both your intent and then reflecting on your intent and saying, is this still the right intent? Is this still the right goal? And so kind of keep those two orders of magnitude in mind and then think about that context, not just for yourself, but also, you know, where you work, uh, why you're working in a particular industry, those kinds of things. And, you know, I think as you mature and get higher and higher in, in your levels and your, your influence, um, you will hopefully be able to help empower other people to think that way as well so that they are more fulfilled in their journeys. Great. Thanks. Um, Pete's going to handle the Q&A. So Scott, it's been lovely to talk to you. And um, we'll thanks so much, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. I got to say, Scott, this is the second time I've heard you speak. And every time I'm so impressed by how you take all these big, complex ideas and then just kind of funnel them down to like its essence. Like, really, that's a real skill you have. And I'm really looking Appreciate forward, that. really looking forward to your TED talk when that comes out. <laughs> so so please let us know. And then I'm sure everybody that's been on the, the video call tonight and also looking at on YouTube have really learned a lot from this. So thank you so much for making time to speak to us here in Amsterdam, all, all the way from San Francisco. Um, very humbling to hear. No, for sure. And we do have a couple questions. So if there's anybody in the audience that still wants to make a question, you have 30 seconds to get it in. But uh, we're going to start here with the first one from Mari. It's um, what would be your advice to startup founders who find that they are no longer aligned on core aspects of what they're doing? I think it's, I mean, I've been in that position and it's really important to uh, be in touch with your values and to express those values and uh, know that your career is long and a winding journey. Um, Daniel Pink, who's a speechwriter, I think he was a speechwriter for Al Gore and I think he, he's written several books on, on uh, motivation and persuasion. Um, I remember him giving a talk at IDEO a long time ago and he said, if you ask anybody who's doing anything interesting how they got there, the only common answer you're gonna hear is, is gonna be a long story. So, the there you know there's always going to be kind of disagreements or or whatnot and so the question is like are you able to work through those disagreements in a productive way and the only way to do that is to uh kind of seek mutual understanding and i think that's just like a good practice in general and especially with those that have a significant influence on your day-to-day -day fulfillment right um when I mentioned that framework of, you know, what do you, what are you good at? What do you care about? What does the business need? Um, the reason I, I am so keen on that framing is because it requires clear articulation. Here's what the business needs. Any disagreements with that, right? Here's what you're good at. Any disagreements there? And here's what you care about. Now, are those things overlapped? If they're not, then how do we get there? Can we get there? And have an honest conversation about those things. And I think that that clarity of communication is something that is really important to get in sync as early as possible. If you're spending, you know, let's, you know, say your time at a particular business happens to be five years. If you're spending four of your years trying to just get clarity and understanding, then you're probably going to be pretty frustrated, right? Because you're probably not making impact. You're probably not doing the things that you care about doing um, and you're probably not aligned with your team members and there's probably a lot of friction there, right? So, you know, so it doesn't happen overnight and sometimes it takes time, but you have to give yourself a reasonable amount of time to try to get to that alignment because once you get in sync, things are way easier. Um, a saying I like 
I, I hear that I, uh, I've heard before that I, I repeat is trust is super efficient. When you trust what's going on, you trust the people around you, then things just move, right? You don't have to double check everything that's going on. But getting to trust is a very difficult thing. People don't trust each other off the bat, right? There has to be some signals there that, that earn that trust over time. So I think, um, you know, a, a book that I would recommend to everybody is Principles by Ray Dalio. And um, the, you know, there are many great gems in there, but one of them that this reminds me of is get in sync and stay in sync, right? And so getting in sync is the hardest part, but once you get in sync, that life gets a lot easier. So um, I don't know if that's too generalized for the question, but hopefully that there's something in there that can be taken away. No, I think that's great. Uh, hopefully Mario agrees. Um, a question from Tuli. What are the most interesting trends, uh, future directions for visual designers? Um, it's interesting. I think um, I, two things come to mind. One is just being like multidisciplinary. Um, and that is like, what I mean by that is, um, of course, designers are great at some sort of craft, right? Um, you know, for me, when I started, it was graphic design. It was, you know, can I figure out how to lay out information, whether it's on a package, on a screen, on a piece of paper? Um, and that was my, my specialization, right? But uh, as I mentioned, IDEA was mind-blowing to me as a professional because empathy was a very important part of my job. Um, not just empathy for the clients I was working for, but also my colleagues who had very different skill sets, empathy for research, empathy for industrial designers, empathy for business designers. So when I say multidisciplinary, I mean, um, maybe a good, a good analogy for this is a T-shaped person, which is another idealism. Um, the depth of your T is your specialization and the breadth of your T is your ability to empathize with other disciplines. And it's actually something that IDEO hires for. They don't look for the lone genius asshole um, because they're really difficult to work with, right? They might be really good at executing something, but if you're looking at dozens or hundreds of clients over your career there, you don't need a very difficult person to work with. I'd rather have somebody that's like pretty good in their depth but like generally very good in collaborating with other disciplines because their specialization may not be applicable to every problem, right? Sometimes the graphic designer or the communication designer um, was leading the final execution of whatever the, the project would be, but sometimes it was a supporting role and it, it would vacillate between those two. And so it's, it's important to like, you know, stay humble, but also know that there are other folks that add value and to be open to that dynamic of, of other people's specialization taking the, the lead at certain times of a process or over the process in general. And if you take a long enough view on your career, you will just you will know that like you are not the most important person in the room at all, at all times. You might be the most important person in the room at certain times. And what experience will give you is the wisdom to know when that is the case. Um, so that's one trend is to like, Think about your your depth, of course, but also think about your breadth. Um, another is, and I know th the question is specifically about visual designers, but um, then maybe this is more applicable to that question. Is um, there is there is so much speed to publication now, or like sh speed to shipping that people care about, right? Um, and I think gra traditional graphic design was on a much longer timeline. You would lay out some document and then you would, you know, send it to a, uh, you do some prints at your own studio and then you work with a printer, you go to a press check. And then finally, when you're ready, like you can't touch it anymore and it's shipped, right? That timeline has gotten compressed, compressed, compressed down to like weeks or days. You know, if I'm thinking about it and I type it, I can, you know, merge the change and ship it, right? There's a, but I think there is kind of like this, this, wide gap that is starting to shrink between design and engineering. And the more that folks, um, even if you're not trying to be a software engineer, to learn, it kind of goes back to this breadth. 
Like, do you have empathy for your engineering partners that are actually doing the work of implementing your design work? How can you translate some of that work so that your intent is um, expressed in the final product? Like a lot of times designers will be like, okay, I'm gonna put all these bells and whistles on, I'm gonna animate the hell out of it. And then the first thing they get cut in shipping any digital product you know, of any serious cadence is your animations or your transitions, right? It's like, oh, that's just fluff, right? But if you can make that translation much smaller for an engineer, or make it much easier for them to, to understand it or to implement it, then your design intent is gonna reach the end user. And I'm, you know, I, I love those things as a craftsperson, but as, a, as somebody who also cares about efficiency, like I know what gets cut, I've seen it happen. And yeah, it sucks when you're the designer that you spend all this time like polishing the hell out of what you imagine this thing could be. And then when you finally see what it actually is, you're like, wait, there's, there's, a, there's a huge gap here. So as much as designers can be empathic to their engineering partners and kind of close that gap between intent and execution, um, maybe that learn that means learning how to code a little bit. Maybe that means like understanding what a cubic Bezier curve is so that your your engineer can say, okay, those are the values I just need to plug in, right? So that kind of stuff, uh, that translation between um, design intent and design ex and and final execution is a gap that I think designers can spend some time closing. Love it. Tuli, I hope that help answers your question. Um, so I, the, the last word is to me. I have three questions. Uh, oh, wow. right on. <laughs> two yes, no's, and then, and then one, one final question. Uh, so the first one, I saw today on TechMeme that Microsoft made a bid for Pinterest. I read that last night as Do well. Do you think that would be a good move on both sides? Um, I mean, I see why it makes sense for Microsoft as a, as a, as a shift to kind of owning a portfolio of businesses. They've made some you know, very interesting acquisitions in the last couple of years, LinkedIn, Minecraft. Um, you know, so I think um, they certainly are, are getting more aggressive with their M&A game. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the, their end game is. I, I, would, I would assume sort of like LinkedIn, they have more data on users that they can start to customize products for, right? Um, for Pinterest, I don't know. Um, is the is the honest answer. I don't know if it makes sense or not. Um, you know, I think my understanding is that they want to kind of maintain their position as an independent business. I, you know, I've heard this saying about acquisitions. It's like you either sell too early or you sell too late. There's never the right time. Um, but I think Pinterest is still on a growth path and they are kind of in charge of their own destiny at this point. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of stay a, a, a private business, but I'm two years removed from the company. I have no insight as to whether or not, you know, that's my, my opinion is irrelevant. It's kind of what I would say. But sure. um, like I said, the honest answer is I don't know. Got it. And um, do you think the future is no code, low code? Uh, I think there will always be uh, a place for hardcore engineering. Okay. Uh, you know, but I do think that the, uh, um, I do think that the more that tools get democratized in general um, and the more expressive people can be, um, I think the better in general. Um, you know, there are certainly, there's certainly a double-sided, double-edged sword there. But, um, you know, for example, fraud can go up if, you, if everything can be made to look and feel legitimate when it's not, yeah. right? Even when you put those tools in people's hands that are too lazy to actually figure out how to do things the quote real way. But at the same time, you've seen this whole entire kind of creator economy emerge in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And, um, you know, a world where it is net positive that people are doing things that are more fulfilling, that are able to express themselves in, in their own unique voice. I think that's a good thing. Um, and when I say net positive, I also mean like in a way where society can still function in a positive and productive way. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I, People are able to set up shop, especially, you know, COVID is a great example of this. Mm -hmm. People had to be resourceful and um, maybe they're starting businesses out of their homes. And what they're trying to do, for example, is like, I want to make a specific, I don't know, a tchotchke or, or widget or whatever. I, that's what I want to focus my time and energy on. I don't want to focus my time on energy and figuring out CSS and HTML and JavaScript and, and then 
how to integrate a backend database and an inventory system. And those tools are kind of have gotten unbundled over time and, and have allowed people to create, you know, uh, these cottage industries out of their own homes. And I think that's very empowering. And so, yes, I think that no code, low code is a part of that conversation. Um, but there will always be, you know, um, room for, the, you know, the bleeding edge of research and development in, in technology, because ultimately that is technology applied, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, I think it will continue to play a, 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 an increasing part in the, the overall ecosystem. And uh, yeah, I would say in general, it's a good thing. Yeah, I, th I think it makes sense. And the reason I asked that is because your background with IFT, right? In a way, you and your founding team kind of created the no code, low code trend, in my opinion. Like you made it super yeah. easy for non techies like myself to automate things that before were only kind of available to developers. So that, that that's right. kind of why I asked that question. Super yeah, interesting. Yeah, the creativity, the creativity like is, well, there's no way that we could imagine what the creativity is on your behalf. Yeah. But if we can empower you with the tools to, be creative, then you will be creative. And I think mm. you see that, you know, on all kinds of different platforms. For sure. And the last question, it will probably bring us over time, but I think it's super interesting from the first time we spoke. Can you walk us through your favorite question to ask designers relative to Amsterdam? Do you, do you know what I'm referencing oh, yeah. here? The, the bicycle yes. thing. Yes. Yes. So um, what is the most important part of a bicycle is the question. And I, I, I guess nobody can answer that because we're on chat. Uh, um, but it's a trick question, and it relates to team dynamics and, and company in, in a couple different ways. It's a trick question because there is no most important part of a bicycle. Um, you can have a, a really great bicycle that doesn't have wheels, and it's useless, right? So when as it relates to kind of team dynamics, um, it's important to understand what you're building. Are you building a bicycle? Great. But also... What does your, how does your team interoperate with other teams for the overall success of that thing, whether it's a company or the product or your team dynamic or whatever. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, everything is close, is bigger when it's close up. If you might be the designer that's working on the, the perfect bell for the bicycle, it's like, oh, this is the best bell ever. It's the most important bell we've ever worked on. But if you don't zoom out, and understand what's the context of what we're doing here. We're trying to build a bicycle and the bicycle maybe isn't functioning at that point in time, then maybe the time spent on the bell is not the, is not the most leveraged, right? That's, a, that's an important question to ask yourself. Um, but on the flip side of that, if the bike is working awesome and everything else is great, the bell may actually in, uh, amplify a great riding experience. Because when you're riding, you don't have to yell at somebody, I'm coming up on your left, or I'm, you know, you can I'll let them know with a, with a kind of ring of a bell. And so the bell does become important at that point in time. So there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of play with this analogy. And as you can probably tell from the many analogies that I have cited in this talk, it's a, it's a way I like to think. Um, and hopefully hasn't kind of bored you or overwhelmed you, but maybe that's one that can be relatable to the folks in Amsterdam. No, I, I think it's fantastic. And I hope your TED talk eventually in, includes that. <clears throat> Again, Scott, thank you so much for making time for us here. Um, maybe a, a final opportunity, anything you want to plug or anything you want to kind of uh, point people towards? No, I, I, I'm, I'm super kind of thrilled to kind of expand my reach beyond the, the United States and um, to folks in Amsterdam. Um, what I would say is like, the future is going to be created by folks that are entrepreneurial like yourselves or people that are on this call. Um, and to kind of like maybe put a bow on it is to like try to do that in a way that, yeah, sure, is world changing or disruptive or all these other things. But try to enjoy your journey, too. Like think about that energy thing that I mentioned at the kind of top of the talk. Um, you like are you are you creating a positive impact on a daily basis just by bringing your energy, your positive energy? And like, can you ask that of your, your circle around you as well? I think the more that people are kind of surrounded by that energy, um, the better off for the world in general. And that's maybe a, a little cliche, but um, I hope that people kind of take that to heart. I love it. Scott, thank you so much. 
Next yes, time you're in Amsterdam, you drinks on Dan and myself. You're always welcome at Startup Grand Amsterdam. Um, I, I look forward to the day that I can fly over there. Us too. Yes, Believe sure. us. Uh, we can't wait.